to wash or not to wash? <laughs> that is the question. Uh, does washing your fruits and vegetables really make them any safer? That's what we'll talk about today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. Uh, we are live every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. This is the show for the methods, the techniques, the insights into better food and cooking. And again, we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. Uh, if you're looking for any of the past shows or any of my past videos, go to the archive on Facebook, facebook.com slash chef dot more slash videos. They did that I didn't make that up. Oh, and if you want to see what I'm cooking for dinner and breakfast now also, just about every day of the week, uh, and also I explain how I did it, then follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well. Welcome, Carefree Cook. Say it with me. I'm a carefree cook. I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together because I'm such a darn good cook. <laughs> Nobody can stand how good I am. Uh, I learn every time I cook. That's a big difference with us. Uh, I create my own cooking style. Don't let other people tell me what to do. Uh, because I practice pro methods and I wind up really loving my cooking. And that's what we are all about. The Carefree Cooks community. Hey, look, there's a lot of scary stuff out there <laughs> right now. A lot of scary stuff. A lot of often misleading stuff. Facts ideas, myths, things about food safety. Now, I want to help you try and clear away any confusion. And I want to assure you, first and foremost, generally your food is safe. There, there's no need for a large amount of paranoia. Food generally is safe. Unless, <laughs> unless you or another human being makes it unsafe. That's the key, and we're going to talk about how to protect yourself from yourself today. Uh, but first, I've got a true or false for you. Tell me in the uh, comments section below, is this food statement true or false? You should always brush, never wash mushrooms because they absorb water. True or false in the comments section below. Okay, you know, it's funny, a lot of people are unsure about today's topic. Are you a little bit unsure about it? Like, are there some vegetables you wash and some fruits that you don't? Or, or like, which ones? Like, do you have a hierarchy in your mind about how you treat some things or the others? Which ones do you think need to be washed and which ones do you think shouldn't be? Because it might hurt them somehow, could could you even wash away nutrients or, or, or vitamins or minerals like I've read in some places? This can be really confusing. But by the time we are finished here together today, I promise you that there will be no doubt in your mind what you should do from now on. It's just another step that we'll take toward breaking the Carefree Cooks Code. So our question today is oh, to wash or not to wash for this is the question tis better to soap and rinse then all uh, right look let, <laughs> let's start uh, thank you from my uh, one man play shakespearean chef play uh, let's start with a little bit of background here okay before we all get hysterical about all the things in the news and all the viruses and all the bacteria and all the things that could potentially happen to your news let live your food let, let's just take a step back all right what makes food potentially hazardous. Now, 
Here's a disclaimer for you. First, not all food is immediately and inherently dangerous. You know, let's, let's not sound all the alarms on all the food yet. Food, again, from my perspective, food generally is good. Generally, we have a good food system. And, you know, if you buy local and you shake the hand of the guy that grew the food, you're doing that much better for you. But I think you can take some of these food safety ideas and fears, and some of them really are unfounded. Some of them are really hysterical because food, again, is not inherently dangerous. Food is not bad. Food doesn't always have bacteria on it. Generally, what makes food dangerous is mankind, is man. Generally, it takes a person to contaminate food, to leave it out overnight, to water it with contaminated water. This is what's going on now. If you think salmonella is only for chicken, salmonella is found in the intestinal tracts of animals and you get salmonella from uh, from undercooking meat. Uh, There's a a topic in the news right now uh, about onions having salmonella. So how does an onion get salmonella. That's nuts, right? It's not in the intestinal tract of an animal. But when you you water your your crops with with contaminated water, so these things can find themselves everywhere, but it always takes a person. It generally takes a person. And to explain all of this and to try and help you feel a little bit better in really hysterical times, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Fat Tom. Okay, so if you want to make sure that your food is safe, or you want to make sure that you can improve the the potential safety of your food or lower bacteria levels to a safe point, I was taught that you never kill all of bacteria. I was always taught that, that you lower it to a safe point. You just assume that there is always some kind of bacteria, something on food, but it's at a safe level for your digestion. But if I remember Fat Tom, <clears throat> excuse me, dry throat today. If I remember Fat Tom, he will help me remember all the things that can contribute to mankind spoiling the food. So remember Fat Tom and you'll remember how to keep your food safe. So these are the things I remember. This is what if anyone's ever taken Serve Safe and learned about HACCP and... and uh, 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 We'll talk about that later. Anyway, let's go over Fat Tom. F is for food. Okay, so to start out, you got to have some kind of food, some kind of biological organism, some some platform to develop, attract, or accept harmful bacteria and have it grow on. So the A in Fat Tom is for acid because the best environment for bacteria to grow and contaminate your food is a low acidic environment. In a heavily acidic environment, most bacteria will die. And this is why tomato sauces, barbecue sauces, citrus juices are generally safer than other items. That's why it's safe to do the hot water canning, you know, the the old uh, 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 frontier, (laughs) on the frontier kind of canning. You do pickles in, in like vinegar solution, right? You do tomatoes, you do highly acidic sauces, you do brined items because the acidic environment won't allow anaerobic bacteria to grow. And this is how you cook fish, right? If you've ever had ceviche, if you've ever done a a curing of fish, salt will do this as well because salt has an osmotic effect. It pulls moisture from things. So if you've ever made beef jerky or you've salt dried fish or you've done gravlox in uh, web cooking classes like we do, you are making your items safer because of this highly acidic, highly salty environment. All right. So And this, you know, you you learn about the history of food. This is why a lot of foods are ceviched or like Jamaican jerk seasoning to hide bad foods, to, to take foods when you didn't have refrigeration that would spoil quickly and heavily salt them or, or heavily brine them, things like that. It helped to make the food safer by killing bacteria. Uh, the tea in fat, in fat Tom, this is for temperature. Bacteria grows more quickly at certain temperatures and is destroyed or reduced to a safe level, like I said, at other temperatures. So this is why we we go through the safe food temperatures. I think we did a week ago, just a week ago. Most food should be brought to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, about 74 degrees Celsius, and kept hot 
four serving at 140 Fahrenheit or about 60 degrees Celsius. Now, yes, Chef Todd, what about a raw steak, a rare steak? <laughs> uh, you, you can have steak tartare also. Chef Todd, what about tuna? I've watched you make that rare tuna in the middle. Yes, there are certainly exceptions, and this always comes from the source of your food. Again, remember my theory here. Food, you can assume your food is safe unless man messes it up. So the tuna that I can be sure is handled really well, the, the beef that I get from the rancher, the whole muscle beef like we talked about versus ground beef, I can be a lot more assured of and I like myself a, a medium steak. I used to like raw steak, a rare steak. I keep saying that. I used to like rare steak. I, I, my temperature range has definitely climbed. Uh, I used to eat a lot more raw clams and oysters. I just don't do that anyway, anymore. So uh, let's talk about these safe temperatures again. Let's say you make something like a chicken salad and you're going to serve it at, at your picnic. Well, there is cold bottom of the line temperatures as well because below 40 degrees Fahrenheit or about four and a half degrees Celsius, bacteria is slowed. Their, their growth is, is diminished. And that's why cold foods need to be on ice or, or served cold at those temperatures. Bacteria uh, is, uh, the temperature allows the bacteria to grow or not. And that, again, is controlled by humans. The temperature that you hold your food at, the, 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 the way you heat it or cool it or leftovers, things like that. All right, in fact, Tom, let's move on. The uh, fourth thing, the next T is for time because the more time that the food spends in this temperature danger zone, right, of 40 to 165 cooked or 140 held hot, 40 to 140 Fahrenheit is the temperature danger zone. The more time that that uh, item spends in the temperature danger zone, the more bacteria gets to multiply. And boy, oh boy, can it multiply. Bacteria can double every 20 minutes, going from just a few to millions and millions in just a few hours. I remember uh, going to a business picnic one time where they had like chicken salad and potato salad and stuff just, uh, it was like a hundred degree day and they just had these bowls, potluck, you know, laid out on the table. The bowls were all sweating, you know, because they came out of the refrigerator. Uh, that is a time and temperature violation of which I did not eat that potato salad. No, <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, o is for oxygen. Uh, most bacteria are aerobic. Most bacteria, they need air. Uh, there are anaerobic bacteria, uh, the ones that grow without air, uh, things like botulism, uh, uh, canned goods, things that are improperly canned, molds in jarred items. So I don't want to say everything needs A for air, but most are aerobic. Uh, the last letter is, letter is M. M is for moisture. And boy, bacteria love a warm, moist environment to grow quickly. And if you think about it, this is why dried beans, you know, dried pasta, none of these things are potentially hazardous. You can keep dried beans forever. You're not, not going to get sick off them. There, there's no water activity in these items for the bacteria to feed on. So now that you know Fat Tom you can start to make your own decisions about whether to wash your fruits and vegetables or not. But there's something that Fat Tom isn't telling us. There's something, again, that Fat Tom is leaving out, and I'm going to get to it again because it is how your food is handled and then how you handle your food because Fat Tom isn't talking about man. It will stab you in the back <laughs> with your food because no matter how aware you are of the six elements that aid in bacterial growth or limit bacterial growth because you should be sure that there's an acid, cooked to the right temperature, cooled to the right temperature, cooked the right amount of time, uh, maybe kept in a vacuum bag to remove the oxygen, right? But somebody else always can come along and contaminate it. They can touch things with their little grubby hands. And it's called cross-contamination. And two-thirds of all the foodborne illnesses are simply because someone brought the bacteria with them and put it on your food with a knife, with a cutting board, with hands, with bowls, with tables, with sneezing, with things like that. The very first thing that you should do before you ever decide whether to wash your fruits and vegetables 
is to wash your hands first. That seems to make so much sense to me. If you are so scared of that fruit or vegetable, just imagine where your hands have been, you know? So let's get to the real reason. With all this background information I've given you now, let's get to the real reason that we should that we're together today. Should you wash your fruits and vegetables or not? It's the should I or shouldn't I to wash or not? Well, think about this. From all I just told you, from all the possibilities to add bacteria, to grow bacteria, to, to ingest pesticides when you're trying to eat healthy, the answer to this question is an absolute positive, always, all the time, yes. Yes, you should always wash your fruits and vegetables, especially if you're going to eat them raw, right? There's a, a study, there, there's a group called the Environmental Working Group, and they keep a dirty dozen list of fruits and vegetables, most likely to have pesticide residue or fertilizer residue. And their most recent list in 2019 <clears throat> gives strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, potatoes, <laughs> you know, pretty much anything. And the, the thing is, these things grow in dirt. So wouldn't you want to wash the dirt off? You're not going to wash any vitamins. You're not going to wash any minerals. That's all a myth. And, and, <laughs> and the more that I read about this stuff, the more I realize also that just rinsing them in cold water isn't nearly enough. But I cannot find a single expert that recommends those commercially available washes the, in the spray bottle and stuff. I, I feel like you, you can put false faith in some of these things because ultimately the best thing you can do to assure the safety of your fresh fruits and vegetables, even with water, is to rub them rub them, not only rinse under cold water, but rub the skins, rub the surfaces, get a soft vegetable brush or a dish a rag or something like that. Because of the uneven surfaces on most fruits and vegetables, and if you look at them under a microscope, many of them have pores, the very porous, that's where bacteria can hide. So rinsing, no good, but rubbing and rinsing, yeah, pretty good. You don't need one of those commercial rinses, but you do need to apply a little elbow grease and scrub your items a little bit. Um, here's another tip. Always use cold water. Don't ever use warm water because bacteria loves the moisture and the warmth, right? You could not apply water hot enough to something to kill bacteria before it scalded your hands. About 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 110 Fahrenheit, if you have hands like me, uh, is when you're going to feel your hands scalding. That's perfect for bacteria. They're, they're like bathing in it, right? So you're not going to use hot water. You're going to use cold water. And web cooking classes members, they know another trick, something that we use in the professional kitchen generally to retain the color, the texture, the nutrition of vegetables. But this same trick can limit or kill bacteria. Uh, I've shown you if you're making potato salad, a highly acidic brine with white vinegar not only adds to the color and appearance, but something highly acidic, I just told you with Fat Tom, reduces bacteria as well. Uh, the baking soda rinse that's been shown to remove pesticides better than plain water. It's a very salty environment, right? It's sodium. Uh, so it also retains the green color in green vegetables. So my suggestion would be, yes, wash your vegetables, but also soak your fruits and vegetables completely in either an acidic bath, a salty bath, a baking soda bath, and then rub them gently with your hands, a brush, a, a, a towel, something like that, and listen to Fat Tom. Use acids. There we go. Use acids in your salads and sauces. Cook them to a precise temperature and then cool them to precise temperatures as well in as little time as possible. Get it through these temperature zones quickly and you and your food are going to be a lot safer this summer. So look, again, just to be clear, I, I, I'm not talking about like a major outbreak like we're talking about right now, all kinds of things in the news. And the Centers for Disease Control, the US CDC, says, continues to say that there is no evidence at all 
to support the transmis- transmission of COVID to food, all right? There has not been any evidence to support this. They say right now, but regardless, you know, you should always practice safe food handling. The, the, the practices that I've talked to you today about, wash your hands, think about acids, think about heat, right? Think about moisture. Uh, think about the time and temperature that you're cooking things to. This is another reason that you need a thermometer to keep your food safe. Wash your hands thoroughly, often during the cooking process. But what I'm really talking about today is foodborne illness, is the simple things, okay, that can make you slightly ill for a day or two. The the simple things, we've all done that, eaten something bad where you feel, just say crappy, okay, for a while. But but now that you know Fat Tom, you'll wash everything, right? You'll wash everything that you cook, maybe even soak it for a little bit. You'll cook it to a precise internal temperature. You won't guess and gash. You'll keep it hot for service. You'll, you'll cool your leftovers quickly all while washing your hands along the way. That's the idea. You, you, look, you have no control over the farmer. <laughs> you have no control over the distribution of your food. That's if you're not growing it yourself, growing it yourself. And you probably turned off the, the, this class 20 minutes ago. But look, you do have control over your personal hygiene. You do have control on how you prepare foods and, and controlling the principles of Fat Tom. Uh, yes, we have outbreaks. Yes, we have things in the news. And I'll give you this last bit of advice. If in doubt, throw it out. You know, a bag of onions is not worth becoming seriously ill over. Uh, If you are unsure, don't put it in your body. But again, my message is most things, because these outbreaks, again, are, are caused by man, about bad holding or bad agriculture practices. Control everything that you have the ability to control with Fat Tom. Okay, that was a bummer. (laughs) <laughs> today. That sucked. Uh, but I'm sorry. You know, it's scary times right now. Uh, if you think food, acid, time, temperature, oxygen, moisture, you can protect yourself a little bit more. So let's look at happy things. Let, let's go to the Carefree Cooks collection, the masterpieces that are being posted in our Carefree Cooks collection. Uh, it is a chicken parmesan uh, storm. <laughs> it, 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 p- chicken parmesan is raining uh, from the clouds in our Carefree Cooks community because I showed everybody my no deep fry, no oil, no pan fry, no greasy. Oh, I hate that stuff so much. Uh, The no oil, crispy, crunchy chicken Parmesan that I did, uh, I think last Thursday. If you haven't seen it again, go to Chef Todd Moore, go to facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos and you'll see it there. Anyway, uh, this is Debbie's. Nice job, Debbie. Uh, Debbie says, really nice to have the crispy fried crunchy without the hassle and the mess of the oil. Exactly what we're talking about, Debbie. She's discovered it. She'll probably never go back to using a quart of oil to make chicken Parmesan or eggplant Parmesan or portobello mushroom Parmesan or tofu Parmesan, whatever you want. Parmesan it any way you want. Just don't pan fry it or deep fry it. Uh, Elena, ah, this was cool. Uh, Elena said uh, she undertook a chicken parm experiment. Uh, she put it on a bed of spaghetti swa- squash, spinach, and eggplant. Really nice, bright, kind of primavera looking dish, right? Nicely done, Elena. Uh, Mary's chicken parmesan and pasta, she said, was to die for. I hope Mary is still with us. You'd hate to think your last meal was chicken parm, right? So I know that's just a phrase, just a turn of words. I'm sure Mary is okay. I'm sure she's still still with us. Good. Uh, Catherine. Catherine did a parm uh, with garlic angel hair pasta. She used ghee, clarified butter, and toasted garlic for this really nice flavor. So it's a really great idea. Like one of the problems with this dish is that you put the tomato sauce on the chicken parm and then you put the tomato sauce on your pasta. Like it's a little redundant. You wouldn't put the same gravy 
on your meat as you would your rice or potatoes. So Catherine was smart. Like she did a different flavor for the pasta. I really like that idea. Nicely done. Uh, Mary has been very busy these days, but she says she's slamming it out of the park. <laughs> I like her phrase. Uh, her chicken parm with a homemade tomato sauce, uh, she says was worth every minute of the hour that she spends simmering this homemade sauce. I know it usually is. Makes definitely the time worth it. Ernie, Ernie says, nice looking dish, huh? Ernie says, really tender. That's all he wrote, really tender. Um, I think Ernie maybe had had dried out, fried in a pan with oil chicken before. So Ernie, you're once again proving that it's not what you cook, but it's how you cook it. Uh, that's pretty much our mantra around here in the Carefree Cooks community, our movement of cooks all over the world. I love seeing people from everywhere. Welcome. If you're new to our movement, our mantra, our battle cry is, it's not what you cook, but it's how you cook it. <laughs> and you know, the, the reason that I say this, and I've been saying this for a while, because when I had in-person cooking classes in my cooking school, I would hear people come in all the time and they would tell me about that certain food that they really, really hate. Pardon. Their whole adult lives. They would say, I hated Brussels sprouts, or I've always hated asparagus, or tomatoes, or salmon, or scallops, uh, or poached eggs. I hear that a lot. I always hated poached eggs. But, you know, just about any food that you hated, any food that you can name, but now that you cook it a different way, or now that you're becoming a carefree cook, and you're examining the methods behind cooking, and you're taking that same food item and you're cooking it in a different method to see the way that you like it. You have a command of all these things, of poaching, of, of roasting, of grilling. I don't recommend grilling eggs, but uh, of braising, of, you know, you put all these things together and that is what makes all the difference to people. And then I get these comments like, I never in my life thought I would be eating Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and now I am, because I love them because it wasn't the Brussels sprouts fault. It was my fault. I was cooking them wrong. Now I like them that way, right? So th this is what carefree cooking is about for sure. Okay, uh, let's get to the true or false uh, today. You should only brush your mushrooms, right? You should never wash them. Mus uh, mushrooms absorb so much water and, oh my goodness. <coughs> Do you know how mushrooms are grown? Yes, in dirt. Well, only a little bit of dirt, mostly fertilizer, mostly crappy. Again, right? Lots of manure. Always, 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 always wash your mushrooms thoroughly with water. Rub them, soak them. They're very dirty little buggers, right? And they do not absorb water. It is such a myth. I'm so tired of hearing this. And it's an easy experiment to do for yourself. Take a bunch of mushrooms, weigh them, right? Soak them in water weigh them again. I bet you they're going to weigh the same. Hey, look, if you know someone who's concerned about the safety of their food or, or maybe somebody who might be freaking out a little bit, you know, worried, worried very much, causing themselves way too much stress, please go ahead, like, and share this video with them so they can get the simple truth about using Fat Tom to help assure that their food is safe. And you can begin your own culinary journey toward becoming a carefree cook when you get my free guidebook it's this one right here. It's the five forks to carefree cooking. It lays out the path to take, the way to go, which way to turn when presented with a fork in the road. And it's really the fastest route to becoming a carefree cook. If you go to fiveforksguide.com, you can download your free copy today. So until next week, ladies and gentlemen, Carefree cooks all over the world every Tuesday where we meet here together and examine the methods, the principles, the techniques behind better food and cooking. This is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye, everyone.